with what you draw. So, so how much time do you So I have a son who's going to be about yeah, an hour and then the time is going to be an hour. Yeah. All right. Right. Just to well, I have a son who's Tell them. Five or five or something. Five. Uh, well, could she just talk about five? So okay. Yeah. Been a bit okay. All right. So, so that sound good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, 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 measures of for acoustics because you can do now quantitative measurements and that's one of the main advantages of frequency domain. So I have uh, four special topics, three special topics, wavelength modulated differential for acoustic spectroscopy, for non-invasive early cancer detection and continuous hypoxia monitoring, uh, simultaneous dual wavelength for acoustic radar imaging, so that allows you now to do multi-wavelength simultaneously at the same time. You can do frequency domain by medical for acoustic phase spectrometry and imaging based on the qualifications of the phase. And then finally, I'll do just this wavelength modulated, which was originally single frequency and single point. Now it's uh, very recently we went up doing our first quantitative imaging of hypoxia in cancerous tissue, which is actually the, what I'm going to leave you with today. So the first topic is wavelength modulation differential for acoustic spectroscopy. We're really looking at breast tissue and breast um, cancer imaging. What one what of the main uh, changes in, in the breast um, nature once there is a, a malignant um, carcinoma appearing is that the oxygen level changes and also the total amount of blood changes. There's more blood because there's angiogenesis and there's also lower oxygen. So one may be able to monitor these two. In order to do that, you have to do it with high precision. And yesterday we saw how you can do it with diffuse optical tomography. And today we see how we're going to do it for acoustics and ultimately with quantitative for acoustics. The foracoustic phenomenon is what I said before, so there's nothing new here. The, trans the, the transducer here and the absorber that uh, emanates acoustic waves to the detector. Um, the, these point spread functions are those that I showed before. That means that the image you're gonna be, we're gonna see is gonna be at least as good as the imaging that you see with ultrasound, with the exception that the ultrasound has a contrast that's different, it's mechanical contrast. This one is molecular contrast. So these are the two things. The, um, what we have with this wavelength modulated, what we came up with is if I can actually home into differences in the absorption coefficient of blood because of differences in oxygen, then that gives me a very high signal, signal uh, versus baseline information because I can suppress everything else except for the absorption changes due to oxygen. That means that the oxygenation, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin uh, content becomes very sensitive, at least the for acoustic signal becomes very sensitive to the presence of the oxygen in hemoglobin. So we're looking at the total hemoglobin concentration and the, the oxygen saturation, which is the ratio of the oxygenated hemoglobin to total hemoglobin, the STO2 and the, the HB, the hemoglobin. So we, because we want to be sensitive enough to identify the threshold of malignancy, and this is where these methods are going to be. If you're if you have already developed cancer, there are many other methodologies that would be just as sensible, more sensitive for you to see it. But right at the threshold, maybe when you start seeing small changes in oxygen that nobody else can see, that is where you want to be. So it is a threshold kind of applications that we'll be looking at with, with this differential scheme seems to be pretty good. So the benchmarks, they like said, are increase in the total hemoglobin and a decrease in oxysaturation percentage. That's what we want to look at. So we expect to see small changes in both benchmarks, which means high sensitivity and not to be fooled, which means high specificity. So we have the same kinds of ideas that, we presented, that Matt presented in the morning. This is the, the spectrum that I've seen many times before. So what we did with this is because now we have a very high control of the frequencies, which is again, going back to the unique situation against as opposed to post 
laser that I can home into two wavelengths. This wavelength here is called the isosbastic point. That is, oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin have the same absorption coefficient. That's good because it's a reference wavelength. And then I can go to this wavelength here, 680, as a very high change of the absorption spectrum for between the oxygenated and oxygenated. So this is the, the deoxy up here, the high absorption coefficient, and the oxygen is the low absorption coefficient. All of the oxygen, all of the states in between, they're taken from here to there. So depending on how much oxygen you have, this is going to go up and down. So what we're doing is we're modulating between, uh, I have two lasers, and they're modulated 180 degrees out of phase, and this goes into a locking amplifier. How many people have used a locking amplifier before? Okay, so one person has. Locking is an excellent instrument. So what it does, it is a very narrow bandpass filter. It is an instrument that actually takes a reference frequency from somewhere, and then it opens a very narrow window at that frequency, and it only allows signals at that frequency with an extremely high signal-to-noise ratio. You can have a, a noise floor, which is also a noise ceiling, and then goes in and digs a very small signal out of the bottom and pulls it out because it is at that particular frequency, and everything else is dead. So that's how good the locking is, and that's one of the main advantages, again, of the frequency domain. You can do single frequency measurement. Now, so what happens is there's one, what we do is we do one waveform up, like, let's say the, the one that corresponds to the one wavelength anyway, at that uh, 808 nanometers and the other one that corresponds to 680, so the B, one after the other. If the two absorption coefficients were the same, what would be happening would be for the first 50 percent you get a certain signal. As this one decreases, this one starts going up. So the, because of the same absorption coefficient, if it was the same, then the, the decay time would match the rise time. So over one period, the overall signal will be remaining constant. It will not be changing. So even though the two components are changing, but when the lock-in sees one or one constant signal, what it does, it opens up a plus one gate for the first 50% of the time and a minus one gate for the second 50% of the time. If the signal is the same, it subtracts the area under the first 50% from the area under the second 50% gives you zero. So a DC signal will give you zero in the locking amplifier. So if the two absorption coefficients were the same, under 180 degree phase uh, difference, then you get zero. But if there is a slight variation between the two, then you're going to see a net signal because one of the waveforms is going to be asymmetric with respect to the other. So if you work out the mathematics, you find out that between the differential for acoustic theory, it gives you information about the absorption coefficient at point A and B, where you this is at laser A and B, this is absorption coefficient at laser B, and then you have the extinction coefficients here involved between the two, and an adjustment parameter that has to do how much light goes into A and how much light goes into B, and that has to be adjusted. If you adjust it properly, then this term here disappears, and the only other term that remains here is the extinction coefficient between the two, that is the oxy at wavelength A and the minus the deoxy at wavelength a. So you can see that A is the one that is sensitive to the oxygen. So if you do it right, you have a very, very sensitive differential measurement right here. And these are some of the theoretical curves that we get. These are called the so-called V-curves. This is for 180 degree phase difference. That means for anything less than, in this case here, I have a relatively smaller power of one laser compared to the other. The power rises. When the two powers become the same, the high sensitivity, unfortunately, is untenable because high sensitivity is when the two powers are the same, uh, which means that I can have the highest um, change in the, in the signal if there's an asymmetry in the absorption coefficient. And then at the same time, the phase is 180 degrees. But if the phase is 180 degrees out of each other and the power is the same, the signal difference is zero. So I have a 180 degree phase with zero, with zero signal. So it doesn't work. So it has to be somewhere away from 180 degrees or away from, from equal powers. So these two signals, the, the ratio of the amplitude and the difference of the phases is crucial. And you control that, have a very high control over those because it's adjustable. So you can get here is 180 degree out of phase for both of them. This is the amplitude and the phase, and you see a phase shift, huge phase shift, because laser A dominates below, 
Laser B dominates above, there is a phase shift of 180 degrees between the two, huge. And then within the phase shift, you can see a very, uh, you can see a very sensitive response to the asymmetry in the absorption coefficient. Or you can move, instead of 180, 186 degrees down, you see something different, similar but different. And you have to move away from the absolute uh, one ratio equal to one, phase difference equal to 180 degrees because you get nothing. The so ratio is equal to 1, the two amplitudes are the same, they subtract to get 0. But the phase differences that you want to have for this method, the, the phase resolution is about 0.05 degrees. This is what gives you a really high uh, signal response. So what happens here is you look, you, you go into tissue between normal, pre-malignant and malignant, because now you're changing the degree of oxygen. And yesterday, Voss was talking about optimizing the optical methods. This method is much better than the optical methods. You can never get a higher sensitivity, such a high sensitivity to the optical method, because simply you cannot have two waveforms to play with right, on and off. And um, what you're really doing is, in this case, you're scanning between the normal and the malignant, and then you just see that there is a phase shift depending on the degree of oxygenation of the tissue. Here is there's some numbers, the normal and the, uh, for the total hemoglobin and the uh, deoxyhemoglobin for normal, premalignant, and malignant. And so you can see we're adjusting the window. How much hemoglobin is going from normal to premalignant? It depends on the organ. Um, breast cancer has particular percentages. Colon cancer has different percentages, so this method allows you to adjust. If you're looking for colon cancer, you may want to go to the threshold. If you go to the threshold, you adjust your amplitude and the phase. Here's a ratio, amplitude ratio of 1.47, phase 181 degrees. So a very steep change here that will help you identify what you want. And the same thing happens with the uh, differential phase for, um, this is um, for normal, um, when we adjust it further down, so we adjusted it so that the premalignant is going to be down in that range. This is the total, uh, the total hemoglobin, this is the oxyhemoglobin. If I set up for um, 51 plus 7 percent for premalignant, this one here is a third, 137 plus 23, that shows pretty much where you want to be. You see, this is the threshold right here. You want to be at that threshold, and the two of them are giving you a very high sensitivity. If you were single ended you do one of the two wavelengths, then what you find is there is no sensitivity here. Whether you're normal or malignant, the, the phase is not capable. It's a very small change in the phase, so it's not capable of giving you what you want. So single ended measurement does not work. The instrumentation is relatively straightforward. We have two laser diodes at 680 and 808 nanometers. We look at um, uh, the, the most important part is the drivers. The drivers have to be very accurate so you can get a 0.05 degree resolution between the, uh, between the phases. We get those, there's one company that makes these drivers. There's another, in Germany, there's another company that makes similar, even better drivers in California. But there are two companies in the world that can make those kinds of drivers. And again, the key thing is to be able to operate in the megahertz range with a peak power about 10 watts. So um, we uh, circulated blood that we oxygenated or deoxygenated using sodium dithionide. There is a recipe in the literature how you can do that. You put sodium dithionide there and you can change the oxygenation level. And also importantly, you can keep the blood from coagulating. So you can have it working for several hours. That's important for you to run the experiment. And then we can also look at the optical properties. In this case, we wanted them for, for um, validation purposes. What the optical absorption coefficient looks like straight through a very thin layer of blood uh, optically, just by mo monitoring the optical transmission to make sure that, you know, to, to, to calibrate the system. The two lasers are coming in from both sides of the blood chamber, the transducer is on top, so they're one on top of the other. You have the, the, the top view and then you have the side view of the two laser diodes. The output signals and the theory go very well together. The phase difference was 180.08 degrees and the modulation waveform was 0.3 megahertz. You can change both of those, but the oxysaturation levels, they go from 97 to 90 to 82, 74, 67. So as you see, big differences here, amplitudes and phases. And we have in the theory, we understand exactly where our signals are coming from, so we have a control over our signals. If we change those and we go to a different range of, uh, 
uh, oxysaturation levels, well, this is the phase difference 184.80, and you can see actually the curves are changing every time, but that means they're adjustable. So we have what we call um, sensitivity um, tunability. I can tune the sensitivity of the system depending on where I want it to be. What is the threshold of non um, of non-linear, of, of sorry, non-linear, but it's not a question of where why I want to get the threshold, where the linearity of the foracoustic signal is retained, but I get a signal away from the baseline. And that is what I'm having right here. I can do it 180 degrees, or I can do it 184. Once I do this, then I have the baseline for this particular organ that has a threshold at a particular concentration of uh, oxyhemoglobin. So sensitivity to nobility. The other thing that you find about these curves is that they're, uh, they're complementary. One typical aspect, when the amplitude ratio is basically changing drastically, the phase isn't. The phase is more or less saturated. You find that not every, all the time, but sometimes you find it. Phase saturates, amplitude is good. Amplitude saturates, phase is good. So they're complementary, but importantly, you get two images out of that or two sets of signals. This is the change when I have a 680 and 680 nanometers, I get the largest change in absorption, so there is a 6.43 degree change. At 808 nanometers, I get essentially very little change because that's a asbestic point, so there is not much, the only change is due to the total amount of hemoglobin, not the oxygen there. But then if you go to the differential, you see those large changes to the phase. So you can compare here the change in degrees, 149 as opposed to 6 and 2. So again, you win that way. Um, you can look at the amplitude, the differential phase in this case was for DP 119 degrees. Um, the tunability, this particular blood sample that we looked at had um, we just tuned the signal so that it would be very sensitive in the small changes of oxygen that we introduced in the blood, which was between 60, 67, and 90 or so, which is a, a good range for malignant tumors in breast. And you can see some of the other differences as well. Again, the, the amplitudes, differential amplitudes, much higher than the single-ended amplitudes. You see those differences. Um, that was also another interesting thing that is looking at the um, hypoxia monitoring in the, for this range, the 0.97, this is 0.61. This shows that when I have an amplitude and a phase, not both of them are sensitive, maximally sensitive at the same, uh, for the same ratio and phase difference. The amplitude is maximum for one, phase is maximum for the other. Most of the time you don't have the ability to change them, but if you do laboratory experiments, you can get the maximum change in the amplitude for one particular set of parameters, maximum change in the phase for another set of parameters. And this is how this method stands compared to other photoacoustic and optical methods. Uh, you get changes for 162.84% for the total hemoglobin, five 0.9% phase for the, um, the, amplitude, the amplitude of the phase here using in vitro sheet blood. Uh, if you go to for acoustic computer tomography, you get these small changes. If you go to a pulse laser 760 nanometers, you get these small changes. So as I said to you, this, there are places where frequency domain wins. This is one of the cases where frequency domain wins. And then uh, if you look, if you do optical sensing, then you get also relatively small numbers. And the reason for this sensitivity is because the acoustic wave, again, is time is on your side. You look at the delay time, and acoustics has a delay. Optics doesn't have a delay. So you really take advantage of that, where the uh, center of gravity of your absorption uh, profile moves in and out, closer to the surface, further away from the surface. So that gives you the small change that you need for the phase difference. So what we conclude is that we have built a differential for acoustic system and we observed a strongly enhanced sensitivity uh, compared to a single ended system and this system has the potential to do early breast cancer diagnosis just by monitoring hypoxia and at a very early stage because I can set my line to be right at the cascade of the curve at, right on top of that, at the bottom, and it starts seeing some of the difference at a very early stage. So this is where this would be good for, early stage diagnosis for cancer. Now, the second one, 
I don't know if anybody has any question about that, differential versus single ended. Um, it's easy to monitor. It's easy to set up. Yeah. Okay, I see no questions. So the second one is to look at how you can do waveform engineering beyond what we said before. And one of those things is introducing uncorrelated chirps. So another issue is sometimes you want to be able to get multispectral imaging, but in some cases, what most cases, what multispectral means is you take one spectrum and you go to the next, you, go to, you switch the wavelet from one to the other, and then you repeat the process. This one here allows you to just go in and look at the same time under different wavelengths, provided that you have linearly produced linearly dependent signals from, from chirps that come in at different times at different angles. So here the, the two mismatched chip, chirps. One of them is going up, well, the other one is going down. You can have both of them together, one laser up, the other laser down. The same kind of a system that I showed before with the blood, the two different absorption coefficients. Here is a case where I have a one laser on. So the cross correlation of the signal 680 nanometers is down here, whereas the one at 805 is up there. So this was at the peak of the absorption. So I have an absorption peak here, but the other one does not absorb, so it's way down. On the other hand, this is the cross correlation with only 805. There's no laser at, at uh, 680. This one is the laser at 680. So that means that this peak goes up, but the other one is down. Now both lasers are on, 680 and 808. So both peaks are generated independently. One of them does not see the other. These peaks are essentially replicas of each one of them indiv individually. So we have done this with two chirps. We have done this with seven or eight chirps. So I'm not showing it here, but something. sometimes you can have a delay of about a few degrees, 12, 14 degrees from one with respect to the other. We did not investigate yet how far the linear independence of these signals goes. We've only seen seven chirps, but I could see 10, who knows how many. It depends on how many lasers I have, but what it's telling me is I can do simultaneous imaging at many different wavelengths. So here's another case um, after introduce the the, the uh, deoxygenation, which gives you exactly the same kinds of things, and you find out also the relative heights. These are not the same height, but you preserve the height of the peak, so you can start doing numer uh, quantitative measurement just by measuring the ratio of the peaks. The, these are simultaneous wavelengths in an imaging kind of a setting where I have the two lasers together, 680 and 805, and then I pick up the information from multiplexers, I end up with an A to D converter and the, the image reconstruction goes down here. So as a result, I get the images one on top of the other. Uh, this was a rat, this was a, a mouse actually that was introduced with a, um, uh, with, with a tumor into the thigh. So we can see the 805 alone. I can see the uh, 800 from the dual image. So these are very similar to each other. And here is the 680 alone. Um, if you look at the scans uh, for multispectral imaging, you can see the cross correlation for the 805, the cross correlation for the 680. So this is, is being used now. We'll, we'll show you some other images, but um, I'm, I want to move forward. I gave you two concepts. One of them was a differential signal. The second concept was multi wavelengths, uh, multi uh, chirping, multi modulation going in at the same time with linearly independent wave, uh, waveforms. The third one is to show you the fluency dependence because I use the phase and I said to you before phase is independent of the fluence uh, because it's a ratio of two numbers. This is the signal that you get, the photoacoustic signal in the time domain after you introduce a, a delta pulse. This is the inverse transform. This is the frequency spectrum. Take the inverse transform, you have the time domain. This is the Grunaisen constant. Grunaisen constant is equal essentially to the expansion coefficient, the square of the speed of sound divided by, divided by the specific heat. So that's the, uh, the linear aspect, and then there is the absorption coefficient that goes in the front. So it's a linear in absorption coefficient. It also depends very much on this gamma. When the gamma is large, the signal is large. Uh, if the effect of the transducer is that if the transducer is low frequency, it starts chopping off some of the high frequency ends. So you're rounding up the edges. 
high frequency transducer, 0 to 20 megahertz, you keep up the sharp lines. When you go down to a very low transducer, then you start having these rounded effects, so it distorts your signal severely. Um, you look at the effect of the transducer bandwidth here too, and you have the, 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 the amplitude and the, the in-phase of the quadrature. The in-phase signal is a similar to the pulse response for an infinitely flat transducer. How do I know that? Well, I go here. I look at the, uh, at the time domain function, and I look, I look at the correlation function. So I have similar parameters right here, the same parameters. Essentially, this one is my chirp, so it has a certain bandwidth from the low end to the high end, just like this one has a frequency spectrum. This is the, 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 the pulse. So inside here, they're very similar to each other. This is the Fourier transform of the pulse. And this is what I'm really getting for each and every frequency of the chirp. So it says that the two of them, in principle, are the same through a Fourier transformation. But the important thing is, whereas the amplitude is out here, the phase is independent of these parameters out there. And importantly, it's independent of this, uh, of the Grunaison constant, and it has the, the mu a in here. So you can see the mu a goes from the outside, but it, the gamma goes, and the ai goes. The ai is the intensity of the laser. So it's, the phase is independent of the intensity, and it depends, again, on the absorption coefficient times the speed of sound, and the frequency that you're monitoring the signal at. So, depending on how, if you have an absorption coefficient that's very high, then you need high frequencies because you need the short penetration depth to be able to probe the top, that, that, that absorption profile. If the absorption profile is very large because the absorption coefficient is low, then you also need to go to low frequencies to pick up the information from in there. So that's why these two, they come in combination. There is, there is a, uh, a, a, an acoustic penetration depth that has to be commensurate with the optical decay profile in order to give you the optimum signal. So we see this, the in phase of the quadrature, and then interestingly, what you have here is a, um, the T. This factor, this Fourier factor, says that the delay time is set at, at L over CS. So L is the thickness of your absorber, and CS is the speed of sound, and it basically goes to zero throughout. Here is, if you look at the phase, the phase has always a zero at this delay time. So that gives, comes like a nice reference uh, time. It says if I am there, then I can see the difference in the absorption coefficients because each one of them, a high absorption coefficient, is going to generate a different phase from a low absorption coefficient. So if I can get the uh, information that I want from that because of that reference, then I can solve for the absorption coefficient. And you see I get the, the theta at this position where t is equal to L over Cx. So that gives me information about the absorption coefficient. It gives me quantitative information about the absorption coefficient without having to worry about the intensity of the laser beam. In other words, it's fluence-free. This is what the, the outcome of that is about. So all of these are instrumental factors. But this one here is what you want. You may be able to get uh, spectroscopy out of this. Uh, that also allows me to identify the transfer function of the transducer because I can take the model, put the, uh, the transducer, uh, put, get the output, and then use the transfer function of the transducer. That is, this transducer has that transfer function that was given to me by the, engine, by the, the manufacturer. If I know that, I can put it in there. But if I do not know it, then I can use the signal output with this model and then get the transfer function of the transducer out because that's what makes a difference. So this is what we have done here for three different absorption coefficients. We got the transducer transfer functions, the real part and the imaginary part, and they're not exactly the same, so we're still wondering why it's not exactly the same. The shapes of the curves are similar, but the other thing is how well do I know that this is 9 and 6 and 4? There's small differences in these absorption coefficients which we put into the system may make a difference in the transducer. But nonetheless, the shapes of the transducers are similar. So if you don't know any better, you can take an average shape and you can put it in there and get a fairly good description of your absorption coefficient. Um, we introduced some of these um, uh, a, a, a two four absorbers and we actually used one of the four absorbers. We knew the absorption coefficient in order to get the transducer effect out based on this model. Uh, we get the transducer effect by what's called the winner filter. Winner filtering 
is basically giving information what is not your the physics of the phonoacoustic signal is coming in due to the transducer and the rest of the system. So this is just a filtering process and it depends on several parameters. Uh, this H the, for the transducer, the transfer function for the transducer and the 1 over the signal to noise ratio. This, this is called winner deconvolution. It's just used in signal processing and it's approximated by the ratio of the measured uh, power spectrum over the standard deviation of the power spectrum in several measurements. So if I know that, then I can get the, the estimate compared to the measured just by getting rid of the transducer. And if you do that, I'm just going to go forward for this particular system that I showed you before, which is again monitoring the absorption coefficient of different uh, oxygenated level of blood, then I can have a, um, for the 97 and 82 percent, I get for the two wavelengths, I get these kinds of responses. Now I can actually put a, um, a, a, a theoretical curve in there that will actually measure the absorption coefficient. So what do I see? I see the, the for acoustic signals from a blood sample at the two different wavelengths and at 680 with and without an upper layer. I put just solely the absorber without a scatterer and then I put the absorber and a scatterer on top. And this is the case with the scatterer. The one I showed you before was with the absorber only. This one, very simple. This one is a scatterer. The scatterer is a harder process to go through because, again, you don't really know what the fluence is that is getting back to your to your to your sample, so to your absorber. So again, it's nice to be independent of the fluence. Um, depending on the hematic rate, we get some curves that give you the, the the phase difference as a function of the oxygenation level. Because remember, there are two waveforms coming in. And that's the result that says, if I look at the oxygenation level using the phonoacoustic phase and amplitude with and without the scatter, what do I get? So this is the case with uh, the phonoacoustic amplitude, the direct laser emission, that is, without the, the scatter. And you can see those follow very nicely the, the difference from the measured with the gas analyzer, this is an independent measurement, versus what I evaluated is 1.6 and percent and the, um, the, the phase is 3.3 percent. But then if you put the scatter on top and you do it without taking into account the, um, the, the, um, the minimum of the absorption which actually gives you the phase, then you're going to have 12 percent for the amplitude, way off. And for the phase, I'm finding the 5.3 percent which is still better than I could do without this kind of the um, of normalization of the signal. So my signal looks very good. In a sense, all I need to do here, what I'm going to take away from this, all I need to do is have the transducer function taken out because you have a theoretical model that bases itself on the fact that you have it, you know the delay time of the arrival of the signal and that gives you an absolute information of the absorption coefficient. So it's absolute information, absolute absorption coefficients that we're measuring based on the phase. Okay. So we did some animal, live animal testing here with, based on this kind of a principle. We ended up with, um, the, with the tumor inside the animal. This one is the ultrasonic signal. It doesn't really show much of the tumor. This is the photoacoustic signal. It shows the surface because the surface always has a, a, a contribution to the signal. And then this second line is the tumor. But if you are to look at this at the bottom, it basically says that I have an amplitude and a phase. So the, this is what the, the rat was doing, the, the, was, the, was the mouse was sitting up on, a, um, on an inclined plane and then the transducer of course was inside the water so it can pick up the information. But on the other hand, when I look at the second line here, this is due to the absorber. This is where the cancer cells were introduced into the, uh, in, into the animal. So that's the amplitude due to the to the cancer cell information absorbed. This is the phase. Again, the phase is more narrow than the amplitude. We have the amplitude and the, the, we have the, the surface and the absorber. And then we take the phase, we take the amplitude and multiply it by the inverse of the standard deviation of the phase. And then you see the amplitude here, you see the higher spatial resolution due to the multiplication of the two, signal sum that I gave you before. 
And then if I take this out, this signal, and so I put it on top of the ultrasonic uh, image, then I end up with a, a co-registration. So essentially, this is the surface, and this is what is lying below. This is the so the the response, the signal due to the tumor. So we obviously ended up with a surface here, and the tumor is superposed on the on the ultrasonic signal. So finally, I'm going to close off with my <coughs> third topic, which is taking this, we, I can do uh, quantitative measurements of the absorption coefficient. Now I can use these two wavelengths, the differential for acoustic uh, imaging, and then I could take that and make an image. I did not use that before. I gave a single ended results because I have blood circulating blood circulating and then I ended up giving you information on how to do the measurement of the absorption coefficient at one point. Now we'll do the imaging. So we use new rats here and we use a, an ultrasonic imager. That ultrasonic machine is a clinical machine but it also has a research interface here. So you can actually put your, uh, your software for the for acoustic signal. Uh, you generate the photoacoustic signal and you process it through that interface and because the laser diodes are small then it can actually go onto this ultrasonic uh, device. So you can get two for the price of one. But all of these are very standard components and you can get the ultrasonic signal out as well. So what I have is a function generator for the differential signal at 808 and 680. Remember, the 808 I still need because this is the reference point, at the isosbestic point, where the blood oxygenation does not matter. And then we have your, the, the animal here and we get the results out of that and we do scanning of the, uh, of the animal. When you do the ultrasonic scanning, you find out the ultrasound shows something, but you don't know what is going on here, there's some differences, and this is essentially where the tumor of the animal is. Interesting thing is, why this is a, an advantage, is that it shows, ultimately, I think I have something to sink my teeth into because I get consistent results. And I show how if I use single ended, or in some cases even differential, without using phase, I don't get consistent results. I get some information from places that do not have cancer cells. And that may be a problem, actually, in case of whatever you use, as long as you do not have a phase. So I'm just bringing up the issue of the phase. We also, of course, did the histology, so we found that these are, this is real cancer at the location of the signal generation. Here is the, uh, the nude rat. The right, high, the right thigh was a reference. The left thigh was the one where you injected the cancer cells. You inject, you wait for a few days, and then they start developing. So what I'm finding here is normalized, reconstructed images using the 680 laser only of the healthy. So this is a, uh, a blow up of the healthy part. So there's some difference, but not very much. The surface is out there. So we left the surface out in order not to foul up the signal. So this was without the skin. And um, this, this was the result of the cancer cell injected thigh. So I already see some differences. The point is, when you go back, those differences sometimes are not consistent. And this is something that is really interesting because it starts raising questions about what is the best way to get a really good uh, grasp of what, where the, the, the tumor is. You get some results, but is this where the tumor is? So here is the case of the differential amplitude, single-ended and differential. So this is single-ended at 680. Normalized, reconstructed, use 680 laser only, A and D. So I can see that I have an amplitude and phase that are normalized with respect to the healthy leg. So the laser be at 808. So I see something here, but um, they're at the two wavelengths. And then when you start looking at the differential signal, suddenly it starts being a bit richer. That is, the differential amplitude, which is like out here, and the differential phase, first of all, they're different. So the question is, if I was only doing amplitude measurements, I'm getting this, but I'm not really sure if this is really the right, am I really getting the right topology of the disease? The phase difference seems to be giving me this. And this is, again, as I'll show you later, that seems to be reproducing itself. 
as opposed to the amplitude, and in fact it makes sense because you'll be getting signals from different parts of the, of the, of the tissue. Parts that are not necessarily cancerous parts, but they have maybe their absorption coefficients. So that these are baseline signals, whereas the phase does not really give you anything that's away from that particular plane because it is the, it is the locus of how, where the signal is coming from. So there may be something below, but the phase discriminates against it. So um, just let me just go to the next one here, that is the image improvement with phase filtering. Remember what we do? We take the amplitude, we multiply it by the inverse of the standard deviation of the phase. So I had the phase filtered images for 680. I had the phase filtered images for 808. That's already, it already shows that there is something here, but it's 808. So this is the differential. So you look at these, and they don't look very similar to each other, but the differential is looking pretty much, it has that echo of what I showed with the phase before. That is, I have a, a tumor that is essentially circular here. Well, not circular, but like a circle. And there's something in the middle that's inhomogeneous. So when I'm looking at this, the phase filtered provides more highly resolved, better contrast, and dimension consistent images of the tumor which is corroborated by the histopathology of the tumor. Now, the, um, the question is again, this is good, that's good as qualitative, but can I come up with a quantitative statement? And this is the last few minutes of that I'm gonna spend on it. quantitative imaging, that is single wavelength measurements, when I look at the, at the concentration of the ox oxygenated hemoglobin, it goes like this ratio here, where epsilon the, are the molar extinction coefficient of oxy and the oxyhemoglobin at 680 and 808. And then I have these ratios, this R, and this is actually the problem because this has fluence information in it. So this changes, when the fluence changes, this changes, when this changes, this changes. So it's fluence dependent. However, there is also this factor alpha, which is the difference in the extinction coefficients, and this factor gamma, which is also another difference, but this is at 808 and this is at 680. If you do two wavelength differential and you look essentially at the, uh, at, the, at the signal, at the phase of the signal, suddenly you lose the R. There's no R here. So you do not have the fluence information, but you get information that also depends on the reference measurement. The reference measurement comes in from the healthy part. That is, I know that where healthy tissue is, I take a reference from that. And I use this as an R right here, as a P. That's a pressure wave that is coming in from the, uh, from the reference signal. But importantly, I do not have the R. So then I can actually go in, put these numbers in there, and try to calculate the molar extinction coefficient. So this is what I'm going to, to leave you with. That is, remember, the high absorption coefficient means I have essentially a deoxygenated uh, hemoglobin. So we put that as blue. You see, blue is high because this is, this basically gives me information about the, um, I put it as red actually, because the, the percentage of SO2 at 90 is basically giving me information about how much deoxygenated uh, hemoglobin I have. And the amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin is what is giving me information about how bad this tissue is in terms of its cancer concentration, cancer percentage. So I do that with the two single wavelengths. Each wavelength was measured amplitude and phase, and the amplitudes are ratioed, and the phases are subtracted. And then I see the amplitudes are all over the map, even with the differential. You see this too, and you find out that there's not a whole lot of, there's some correlation, but I don't really home in to the cancerous part. On the other hand, if you look at the phase filtered amplitude, after I subtracted the two independent wavelengths, I see something here. So this looks good. This looks like where the cancer is supposed to be. It also gives me a quantitative measurement because I measure the intensity of that, then I can tell that this is the oxygen percent. And then finally, when I look at the differential phase difference, that is giving me again what I showed before, that is the, the, um, the morphology of those cancerous regions that seem to be repeating itself time and again. Whereas if I do single wavelength measurements, those seem to be changing. So the question is every time when I do single wavelength measurements, do I know what the morphology is. Maybe yes, maybe not. This work here basically tells us we've got to be careful. 
And then, but if you do it this way, and you do the differential measurement, and you take the phase, then that seems to be giving you a quantitative measurement of the degree of oxygenation, which to my, in my understanding, this is the first time that an image like that appears, <coughs> where you can actually get quantitative cancer uh, uh, oxygen concentration information, and see also the, the, the fact that this is essentially anisotropic in homogeneous. The degrees are different across the tumor uh, area. So, to conclude this part uh, of the talk is that we have two frequency domain waveform engineering methods that we introduced as we've been developing this technology. And um, one of them, I show to you simultaneous dual wavelength for acoustic radar imaging. We can do both of these wavelengths together and get images at different wavelengths at the same time. One of the good adva advantages of that is if, for instance, people are breathing, so the patient is breathing, that you should be able to actually take simultaneous measurements of the, uh, of the tissue at the same time. So all of them are measured uh, under the same time conditions. You don't have a delay time to do one image after the other after the other. So simultaneous works very nicely that way. And then I also showed you frequency domain biomedical for acoustic phase spectrometry and imaging. First of all, I showed that the differential measurement is much higher dynamic range than the single end of measurement, as we did measurements for a single point, and then we quantified that. We said that quantitatively I can measure the absorption coefficient by knowing the, the zero of the delay time that comes into the phase, or the minimum of the phase. That gives me the absorption coefficient. Once I know the absorption coefficient, then I can do quantitative analysis because I can measure how the absorption coefficient depends on the concentration of oxygen, for instance, because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So now that I measure the absorption coefficient, I relate that to the oxygenation or deoxygenation, and then I can do <laughs> quantitative imaging, which is what I did before, especially quantitative imaging of cancer cells that are the primary reason in our case for having lower oxygen concentration. Um, we did live animal testing and we demonstrated the dysfunctions. And we believe that this will be valuable for clinical applications because it detects benchmarks of tumor formation, such as angiogenesis and hypoxia. Then the phase filtering allows you to do many things, one of them quantitative measurements, and the other one more highly resolved for acoustic images because the phase has a higher spatial resolution than the amplitude. So now what we're really doing is we're trying to amalgamate both the ultrasound and the acoustic radar modalities into one image. We have done that already, but we try to do that in 3D. So we're ending up like essentially adding up different levels, different depths in the um, in the subsurface imaging because the phase again allows you a very high discrimination from different depths since it's a different phase. And importantly, as you know, as I showed before, the acoustic phase changes very drastically with depth. So I have a very high dynamic range phase information. It's a small uh, change on the order of a couple of millimeters or so below the surface, below this particular absorber, corresponds to a relatively strong phase difference. So I can log on to that and eventually end up doing one image at a time as a function of depth. So do three-dimensional quantitative imaging, at least of hypoxia, but I, by doing that, maybe three-dimensional imaging of the, of the cancer um, morphology, which is what we want to do as a next step. So I have some references here that are probably are going to show up with the camera, but are not showing up here, where all of these aspects that many people have contributed, not only to our work, but also other people uh, who have done similar work. Uh, recently, there is a, a trend of people uh, working more in frequency domain. There are other groups that are picking up frequency domain. Uh, Vasily Giacristos' group is one of them. Um, the, the question is, how is this going? How is it going to develop? And I think that there are advantages, definite advantages that I showed you today. There are disadvantages. This, the single noise ratios need more work to be done, but we're getting there. Uh, so I think ultimately this technology is going to be um, in, in specific areas. But most importantly, I think what it's going to be is at the point where you look at the threshold, just right at the point where things are changing, or the oxygen changes are very slow, very, very low, where you really need dynamic range that is controlled by a high signal to noise ratio and, and high um, differences in the response, such as two wavelengths at a time. <laughs>
for differential wavelength measurements. I think this is the differential measurement. I think it's crucial to this methodology, and there's nothing like that in the time domain. You cannot just get differential measurements that way. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at that, and that's the end of my second. Thank you very much. This is the technology, and you can just try to say, can I get optical coherence tomography, time domain, and frequency domain? You know, the, the, the technology is different. They're writing in different technologies. I mean, I could still compare the boundaries of time domain with the boundaries of uh, spectral domain. So in the well, same way, as I said, as I said, this way here gives you very high control of the waveforms that you put in there, and you can do waveform engineering, something that's not easy to do. People have been doing wavefront engineering, but not waveform engineering. So this is, this is a different technology. I think what we're really aiming at is to be able to use a sportable semiconductor laser diodes that go on top of an existing uh, ultrasonic imager to give you the, uh, put the software in there and have two images for the price of one, but also being able to do these high dynamic range effects that are not easy to do with the time domain stuff. Just, I, guess. I guess, for instance, that the detector for this method will be of low cost than the detector for a pulse one, or it has to be small and high frequency. Yeah, I'm, be... I'm, really, I'm really looking at low frequencies right now. This is a pain, one to five megahertz. But no. It's the same. It's the same. I if, I, if I want to go to high to high frequencies, I can change the you know, detector to go to high. Right now, what I can tell you is that the next application, the one we're working on, is is an endoscopy system where we have a catheter. For that, we ended up uh, going up to 25 megahertz. 25 megahertz is a different ball game from 5 megahertz. We have very narrow, small transducers. So the transducer response has to be commensurate with the modulation frequency range that you use it with these lasers. So as long as I have the driver, it's not a laser, it's a driver. Now we have the drivers. Last year those drivers did not exist. This year there's a company that makes them for us. I can go up to 25 megahertz. That is making more realistic for clinical applications for endoscopy. But the transducer has to admit it's a, it's a, it's a needle transducer, right? So that's what you need. It's the same physics. Just one of them is a Fourier transform of each other, but having said that, the technology to attain this physics is quite different from what you attain otherwise. Okay, very good. So uh, we have uh, coffee at the post room. So let's go. Okay. <laughs>